All right. The three magic gates. Do you want to see the picture? Mm -hmm. oh. Falgor was still sound asleep when Engiwook brought Atreyu back to the gnome's cave. In the meantime, Urgle had moved the little table into the open and put on all sorts of sweets and fruits and herb jellies. There were also little drinking cups and a pitcher of fragrant herb tea. The table was lit by two tiny oil lamps. Sit down, Urgle commanded. Atreyu must eat and drink something to give him strength. Medicine alone is not enough. Thank you, said Atreyu. I'm feeling fine already. No back talk, Urgel snapped. As long as you're here, you'll do as you're told. The poison in your body has been neutralized, so there's no reason to hurry, my boy. You've all the time you need. Just take it easy. It's not on my account, said Atreyu, but the childlike empress is dying. Even now, every hour may count. Rubbish, the old woman grumbled. Hey! Makes waste. Sit down. Eat. Drink. Better give in, Ingiwook whispered. I know the woman from A to Z. When she wants something, she gets it. Besides, you and I have a lot to talk about. Atreyu squatted cross-legged at the tiny table and fell to. Every bite and every swallow made him feel as if warm golden life were flowing into his veins. Only then did he notice how weak he had been. Bastion's mouth watered. It seemed to him that he could smell the aroma of the gnome's meal. He sniffed the air, but of course it was only imagination. His stomach growled audibly. In the end, he couldn't stand it any longer. He took his apple and the rest of his sandwich out of his satchel and ate them both. After that, though far from full, he felt a little better. Then he realized that this was his last meal. The word last terrified him. He tried not to think of it. Where do you get all these good things? Atreyu asked Urgle. Oh, Sunny, she said. It takes lots of running around to find the right plants. But he, this knuckle-headed Engiwook of mine, insists on living here because of his all-important studies. Where the food is to come from is the least of his worries. Woman, said Engiwook with dignity, how would you know what's important and what isn't? Be off with you now and let us talk. Mumbling and grumbling, Urgle withdrew into the little cave and a moment later Atreyu heard a great clatter of pots and pans. Don't mind her, said Engiwook under his breath. She's a good old soul. She just needs something to grumble about now and then. Listen to me, Atreyu. I'm going to let you in on a few things you need to know about the Southern Oracle. It's not easy to get to you, Yulila. In fact, it's rather difficult. But I don't want to give you a scientific lecture. Maybe it will be better if you ask questions. I tend to lose myself in details. Just fire away. All right, said Atreyu. Who or what is you, Yulila? Engiwook gave him an angry look. Botheration, he sputtered. You're so blunt, so direct. Just like my old woman, couldn't you start with something else? I try you thought a while. Then he asked, that big stone gate with the sphinxes, is that the entrance? That's better, said Engiwook. Now we'll get somewhere. Yes, that gate is the entrance, but then come two more gates. And Yulala's home is behind the third, if one can speak of her having a home. Have you yourself ever been with her? Don't be absurd, replied Engiwook, again somewhat nettled. I am a scientist. I have collected and collated the statements of all the individuals who have been there. The ones who have come back, that is. Very important work. I can't afford to take personal risks. It could interfere with my work. I see, said Atreyu. Now, what about these three gates? Ingiwook stood up, folded his hands behind his back, and paced. The first, he lectured, is known as the Great Riddle Gate. The second is the Magic Mirror Gate. And the third is the No Key Gate. Strange, Atreyu broke in. As far as I could see, there was nothing behind that stone gate but an empty plane. 
Where are the other gates? Be still, Ingi Wook scolded. How can I make myself clear if you keep interrupting? It's very complicated. The second gate isn't there until a person has gone through the first. And the third isn't there until the person is, has the second behind him. And you, your ally, isn't there until he's passed through the third. Simply not there. Do you understand? What? Atreyu nodded, but preferred to say nothing for fear of irritating the gnome. Through my telescope, you've seen the first, the Great Riddle Gate, and the two Sphinxes. That gate is always open. Obviously, there's nothing to close. But even so, no one can get through. Here, Ingiwook raised a tiny finger. Unless the Sphinxes close their eyes. And do you know why? The gaze of a Sphinx is different from the gaze of any other creature. You and I and everyone else, our eyes take something in. We see the world. A Sphinx sees nothing. In a sense, she's blind, but her eyes send something out. And what do her eyes send out? All the riddles of the universe. That's why these sphinxes are always looking at each other, because only another sphinx can stand a sphinx's gaze. So try to imagine what happens to one who ventures into the area where those two gazes meet. He freezes to the spot. Unable to move until he has solved all the riddles of the world. If you go there, you'll find the remains of those poor devils. But, said Atreyu, didn't you say that their eyes sometimes close? Don't they have to sleep now and then? Sleep? Angiwook was shaken with giggles. Goodness gracious, a sphinx sleep! I should say not. You really are an innocent. Still, there's some point to your question. All my research, in fact, hinges on that particular point. The sphinxes shut their eyes for some travelers and let them through. The question that no one has answered up until now is this. Why one traveler and not another? Because you mustn't suppose they let wise, brave, or good people through and keep the stupid, cowardly, and wicked out. Not a bit of it. With my own eyes, I've seen them admit stupid fools and treacherous knaves, while decent, sensible people have given up after being kept waiting for months. And it seems to make no difference whether a person has some serious reason for consulting the oracle or whether he's just come for the fun of it. Haven't your investigations suggested some explanation, Atreyu asked? Angry flashes darted from Engiwuk's eyes. Have you been listening or haven't you? Didn't I just say that so far no one has answered the question? Of course, I've worked up a few theories over the years. At first, I thought the Sphinx's judgment might be guided by certain physical characteristics, size, beauty, strength, and so on. But I soon had to drop that idea. Then I toyed with numerical patterns. The idea, for instance, that three out of five were regularly excluded, or that only prime number candidates were admitted. That worked pretty well for the past, but for forecasting, it was no use at all. Since then, I've come to the conclusion that the Sphinx's decision is based on pure chance and that no principle whatever is involved. But my wife calls my conclusion scandalous, unfantastic, and absolutely unscientific. Are you starting your old nonsense again? Came Urgle's angry voice from the cave. Shame on you! Such skepticism only shows that the bit of brain you once had has dried up on you. Hear that? said Angie Wook with a sigh. And the worst of it is that she's right. What about the childlike Empress's amulet, Atreyu asked? Do you think they'll respect it? They, too, are natives of Fantastica, after all. Yes, I suppose they are, said Angie Wook, shaking his apple-sized head. But to respect it, they'd have to see it. And they don't see anything. But their gaze will strike you. And I'm not so sure the Sphinxes would obey the childlike Empress. Maybe they're greater than she is. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, it's most worrisome. And what do you advise? Atreyu asked. You will have to do what all the others have done. Wait and see what the Sphinxes decide. Without hoping to know why. Atreyu nodded thoughtfully. Ergo came out of the cave. In one hand, she held a bucket with some steaming liquid in it. And under her other arm, she was carrying a bundle of dried plants. 
Muttering to herself, she went to the luck dragon, who was still lying motionless, fast asleep. She started climbing around on him and changing the dressings on his wounds. Her enormous patient heaved one contented sigh and stretched. Otherwise, he seemed unaware of her ministrations. Couldn't you make yourself a little useful, she said to Angie Wook. Sorry, I forgot the voice. Couldn't you make yourself a little useful, she said to Angie Wook as she was hurrying back to the kitchen. Instead of sitting around like this talking rubbish, I am making myself extremely useful. Her husband called after her, possibly more useful than you, but that's more than a simple-minded woman like you will ever understand. Turning to Atreyu, he went on. She can only think of practical matters. She has no feeling for the great overarching ideas. I had to pause because Chaz wanted to show me the comic that she drew while I was reading. <laughs> and she has this comic here that shows a Hufflepuff in the Hufflepuff common room. Falling down and breaking their neck and going to Madame Pomfrey. I have no idea. I'm wondering if the things that I read to my children have an effect on their psyche. I have no idea how she broke her neck just from falling down. It was a curse. Okay, here we go. The clock in the belfry struck three. By now, Bastion's father must have noticed, if he was ever going to, that Bastion hadn't come home. Would he worry? Maybe he'd go looking for him. Maybe he had already notified the police. Maybe calls had gone out over the radio. Bastion felt a sick pain in the pit of his stomach. But if the police had been notified, where would they look for him? Could they possibly come to this attic? Had he locked the door when he came back from the toilet? He couldn't remember. He got up and checked. Yes, the door was locked and bolted. Outside, the November afternoon was drawing to a close. Ever so slowly, the light was falling. To steady his nerves, Bastion paced the floor for a while. Looking about him, he discovered quite a few things one wouldn't have expected to find in a school. For instance, a battered old Victrola with a big horn attached. God only knew when and by whom it had been brought here. In one corner, there were some paintings and ornate gilt frames. They were so faded that hardly anything could be made out. Only here and there, a pale, solemn-looking face that shimmered against a dark background. And then there was a rusty, seven-armed candelabrum, still holding the stumps of thick wax candles bearded with drippings. Bastion gave a sudden start, for looking into a dark corner he saw someone moving. But when he looked again it dawned on him that he'd only seen himself, reflected in a large mirror that had lost half its silvering. He went closer and looked at himself for a while. He was really nothing much to look at with his pudgy build and his bow legs and pasty face. He shook his head aloud and said, No! Then he went back to his mats. By then, it was so dark that he had to hold the book up to his eyes. What's wrong, babe? I can't remember what the Slytherin house colors are. Green and silver. Where were we? Angiwook asked. At the Great Riddle Gate, Atreyu reminded him. Right. Now, suppose you manage to get through. Then, and only then, the second gate will be there for you. The magic mirror gate. As I've said, I myself have not been able to observe it. What I tell you has been gleaned from traveler's accounts. The second gate is both open and closed. Sounds crazy, doesn't it? It might be better to say neither open nor closed. Though that doesn't seem to make it any less crazy. The point is that this gate seems to be a big mirror or something of the kind, though it's made neither of glass nor of metal. What it is made of, no one has ever been able to tell me. Anyway, when you stand before it, you see yourself, but not as you would in an ordinary mirror. You don't see your outward appearance. What you see is your real innermost nature. If you want to go through, you have to, in a manner of speaking, go into yourself. Well, said Atreyu, it seems to me that this magic mirror gate is easier to get through than the first. Wrong, cried Angie Wook. Once again, he began to trot back and forth in agitation. Dead wrong, my friend. I've known travelers who considered themselves absolutely blameless to yelp with horror and run away at the sight of the monster grinning out of the mirror at them. We had to care for some of them for weeks before they were even able to start home. We? growled Urgle, who was passing with another bucket. I keep hearing we, 
When did you ever take care of anybody? Angiwook waved her away. Others, he went on lecturing, appear to have seen something even more horrible, but had the courage to go through. What some saw was not so frightening, but it still cost every one of them an inner struggle. Nothing I can say would apply to all. It's a different experience each time. Good, said Atreyu. Then at least it's possible to go through this magic mirror gate. Oh, yes, of course it's possible, or it wouldn't be a gate. Where's your logic, my boy? But it's also possible to go around it. Or isn't it? Yes, indeed, said Angie Wook. Of course it is, but if you do that, there's nothing more behind it. The third gate isn't there until you've gone through the second. How often do I have to tell you that? I understand. But what about this third gate? That's where things get really difficult. Because, you see, the no-key gate is closed. Simply closed. And that's that. There's no handle and no doorknob and no keyhole. Nothing. My theory is that this single, hermetically closed door is made of fantastic and selenium. You may know that there's no way of destroying, bending, or dissolving fantastic and selenium. It's absolutely indestructible. Then there's no way of getting through? Not so fast. Not so fast, my boy. Certain individuals have got through and spoken to you, Yalala. So the door can be opened. But how? Just listen. Fantastic and selenium reacts to our will. It's our will that makes it unyielding. But if someone succeeds in forgetting all purpose, in wanting nothing at all, to him, the gate will open of its own accord. Atreyu looked down and said in an undertone, If that's the case, how can I possibly get through? How can I manage not to want to get through? Angiwook sighed and nodded, nodded and sighed. Just what I've been saying. The no-key gate is the hardest. But if I succeed after all, Atreyu asked, will I then be in the Southern Oracle? Yes, said the gnome. But who or what is you, Yalala? No idea, said the gnome, and his eyes sparkled with fury. None of those who have reached her has been willing to tell me. How can I be expected to complete my scientific work if everyone cloaks himself in mysterious silence? I could tear my hair out if I had any left. If you reach her, Atreyu, will you tell me? Will you? One of these days, my thirst for knowledge will be the death of me, and no one, no one is willing to help. I beg you, promise you'll tell me. Atreyu stood up and looked at the great riddle gate, which lay bathed in moonlight. I can't promise that, Angiwook, he said softly, though I'd be glad to show my gratitude. But if no one has told you who or what Yuyalala is, there must be a reason. And before I know what that reason is, I can't decide whether someone who hasn't seen her with his own eyes has a right to know. In that case, get away from me! screamed the gnome, his eyes literally spewing sparks. All I get is ingratitude! All my life I wear myself out trying to reveal a secret of universal interest and no one helps me! I should never have bothered with you! And with that, he ran into the little cave and a door could be heard slamming within. Urgle passed Atreyu and said with a titter, The old fool means no harm, but he is always running into such disappointments with this ridiculous investigation of his. He wants to go down in history as the one who solved the great riddle, the world-famous gnome Engiwook. You mustn't mind him. Of course not, said Atreyu. Just tell him I thank him with all my heart for what he's done for me, and I thank you too. If it's allowed, I will tell him the secret, if I come back. Then you're leaving us? Urgle asked. I have to, said Atreyu. There's no time to be lost. Now I shall go to the Oracle. Farewell. And in the meantime, take good care of Falkor the Luck Dragon. With that, he turned away and strode toward the Great Riddle Gate. Ergo watched the erect figure with the blowing cloak vanish among the rocks and ran after him, crying, Lots of luck, Atreyu! But she didn't know whether he had heard or not. As she waddled back to her little cave, she muttered to herself, He'll need it, all right. He'll need lots of luck. Atreyu was now within fifty feet of the great stone gate. It was much larger than he judged from a distance. Behind it lay a deserted plain, 
There was nothing to stop the eye, and a treyu's gaze seemed to plunge into an abyss of emptiness. In front of the gate and between the two pillars, a treyu saw only innumerable skulls and skeletons, all that was left of the varied species of fantasticans who had tried to pass through the gate, but had been frozen forever by the gaze of the sphinxes. But it wasn't these gruesome reminders that stopped Atreyu. What stopped him was the sight of the sphinxes. He had been through a good deal in the course of the great quest. He had seen beautiful things and horrible things. But up until now, he had not known that one and the same creature can be both. That beauty can be terrifying. The two monsters were bathed in moonlight. And as Atreyu approached them, they seemed to grow beyond measure. Their heads seemed to touch the moon, and their expression as they looked at each other seemed to change with every step he took. Currents of a terrible, unknown force flashed through the upraised bodies, and still more through the almost human faces. It was as though these beings did not merely exist in the way that marble, for instance, exists, but as if they were on the verge of vanishing, but would recreate themselves at the same time. For that very reason, they seemed far more real than anything made of stone. Fear gripped Atreyu. Fear not so much of the danger that threatened him as of something above and beyond his own self. It hardly grazed his mind that if the Sphinx's gaze should strike him, he would freeze to the spot forever. No. What made his steps heavier and heavier until he felt as though he were made of cold gray lead was fear of the unfathomable, of something intolerably vast. Yet he went on. He stopped looking up. He kept his head bowed and walked very slowly, foot by foot toward the stone gate. Heavier and heavier grew his burden of fear. He thought it would crush him, but still he went on. He didn't know whether the Sphinxes had closed their eyes or not. Would he be admitted, or would this be the end of his great quest? He had no time to lose in worrying. He just had to take his chance. At a certain point, he felt sure that he had not enough willpower left to carry him a single step forward, and just then he heard the echo of his footfalls within the great vaulted gate. Instantly, every last shred of fear fell from him, and he knew that whatever might happen, he would never again be afraid. Looking up, he saw that the great riddle gate lay behind him. The sphinxes had let him through. Up ahead, no more than twenty paces away, where previously there had been nothing but the great empty plain, he saw the magic mirror gate. This gate was large and round like a second moon, for the real moon was still shining high in the sky, and it glittered like polished silver. It was hard to imagine how anyone could pass through a metal surface, but Atreyu didn't hesitate for a moment. After what Anguiwak had said, he expected a terrifying image of himself to come toward him out of the mirror, but now that he had left all fear behind him, he hardly gave the matter a thought. What he saw was something quite unexpected, which wasn't the least bit terrifying, but which baffled him completely. He saw a fat little boy with a pale face, a boy his own age, and this little boy was sitting on a pile of mats, reading a book. The little boy had large, sad-looking eyes, and he was wrapped in frayed gray blankets. <laughs> Behind him, a few motionless animals could be distinguished in the half-light. An eagle, an owl, and a fox. And farther off, there was something that looked like a white skeleton. He couldn't make out exactly what it was. Bastion gave a start when he realized what he had just read. <laughs> Why, that was him! The description was right in every detail. The book trembled in his hands. This was going too far. How could there be something in a book that applied only to this particular moment and only to him? It could only be a crazy accident, but a very remarkable accident. Bastion, he said aloud, you really are a screwball. Pull yourself together. He had meant to say this very sternly, but his voice quavered a little, for he was not quite sure that what had happened was an accident. Just imagine, he thought, what if they've really heard of me in Fantastica? Wouldn't that be wonderful? But he didn't dare say it aloud. A faint smile of astonishment played over Atreyu's lips as he passed into the mirror image. He was rather surprised that he was succeeding so easily in something that others had found insuperably difficult. But on the way through, he felt a strange, prickly shudder. He had no suspicion of what had really happened to him. For when he emerged on the far side of the magic mirror gate, 
He had lost all memory of himself, of his past life, aims, and purposes. He had forgotten the great quest that had brought him there, and he didn't even know his name. He was like a newborn child. Up ahead of him, only a few steps away, he saw the no-key gate, but he had forgotten its name and forgotten that his purpose in passing through it was to reach the Southern Oracle. He had no idea why he was there or what he was supposed to do. He felt light and cheerful, and he laughed for no reason, for the sheer pleasure of it. The gate he saw before him was as small and low as a common door and stood all by itself with no walls around it on the empty plain, and this door was closed. Atreyu looked at it for a while. It seemed to be made of some material with a coppery sheen. It was nice to look at, but Atreyu soon lost interest. He went around the gate and examined it from behind, but the back looked no different than the front, and there was neither handle nor knob nor keyhole. Go through it. Ob obviously, this door could not be opened, and anyway, why would anyone want to open it since it led nowhere and was just standing there? For behind the gate, there was only the wide, flat, empty plain. Atreyu felt like leaving. He turned back, went around the magic mirror gate, and looked at it for some time without realizing what it was. He decided to go away. No, no, don't go away, said Bastion aloud. Turn around. You have to go through the no-key gate. But then turned back to the no-key gate. He wanted to look at its coppery sheen again. Once more, he stood in front of the gate, bending his head to the left, bending it to the right, enjoying himself. Tenderly, he stroked the strange material. It felt warm and almost alive, and the door opened by a crack. Atreyu stuck his head through, and then he saw something he hadn't seen on the other side when he walked around the gate. He pulled his head back, looked past the gate, and saw only the empty plain. He looked again through the crack in the door and saw a long corridor formed by innumerable huge columns. And farther off there were stairs and more pillars and terraces and more stairs and a whole forest of columns. But none of these columns supported a roof. For above them, Atreyu could see the night sky. He passed through the gate and looked around him with wonderment. The door closed behind him. The clock in the belfry struck four. Little by little, the murky light was failing. It was getting too dark to read by. Bastion put the book down. What was he to do now? There was bound to be electric light in this attic. He groped his way to the door and ran his hand along the wall, but couldn't find a switch. He looked on the opposite side, and again, there was none. He took a box of matches from his trouser pocket. He always had matches on him, for he had a weakness for making little fires. But they were damp, and the first three wouldn't light. In the faint glow of the fourth, he tried to locate a light switch, but there wasn't any. The thought of having to spend the whole evening and night here in total darkness gave him the cold shivers. He was no baby, and at home or in any other familiar place, he had no fear of the dark. But this enormous attic with all these weird things in it was something else again. The match burned his fingers, and he threw it away. For a while, he just stood there and listened. The rain had let up, and now he could barely hear the drumming on the big tin roof. Then he remembered the rusty seven-armed candelabrum he had seen. He groped his way across the room, found the candelabrum, and dragged it to his big pile of mats. He lit the wicks in the, thin, in the thick stubs, all seven, and a golden light spread. The flames crackled faintly and wavered now and then in the draft. With a sigh of relief, Bastion picked up the book. No, go look for 